So this morning in the parable series, you guys are in for a treat. All right, we're going to talk about the heart, the heart of man. Say the heart of man. Say the heart of woman. I don't want women to feel left out. Like this also this applies to you. It's not like you guys get to leave and just the men get to stay in here. But it's the heart of man. And when we think about the heart, right? Life starts when the heart starts beating. Life ends when the heart stops beating. Your heart is the one organ you can't live without, and it's the organ that gives life to the rest of the body, right? A lot of times we think about the brain, like what can you do without a brain? What can the brain do without the heart pumping blood? To it, Okay, so the heart is the one that gives life to the rest of the body. It's important. The health of your heart is important. It's the center of the human body. And we have a lot of sayings about the heart. We hear things like, from the heart, right? I'm saying this from the heart. I have a big heart. We say, I had a change of heart. Sometimes we say we have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Christians say we got to come to Jesus meeting, right? But, but most people will say we have a heart-to-heart -heart talk here. Say your heart is in the right place. Your heart is set on something. And then we say these things like, know your heart. And this is the worst one of all is, follow your heart. All these sayings about the heart. Why do we say these things? Because these things make us feel good about the condition of, of the heart. You know, most people believe today that, uh, you know, that man is basically good, right? I mean, like, we're, we're pretty much, we're good. Uh, and, and this belief causes us to make excuses for sin, and it causes us to point to external sources as the reasoning for the things that we do. But Jesus how many of you know he strips away excuses, right? You don't get excuses when it comes to Jesus. Did Jesus ever let anybody get by with some kind of excuse? No, he tells them the truth. He exposes hypocrisy in religion, and this is what he does in today's text. He exposes hypocrisy in religion. He gets to, you might say, the heart of the problem. And so in Matthew chapter 7 is where we'll be today. If you've been reading along in the yearly Bible plan, you read this this week. Um, but we see the Pharisees and the scribes, what they're doing is they are criticizing Jesus because the disciples are eating bread without washing their hands, right? Now, it's not like what we do, okay? Just a simple go wash your hands. Like, that's okay, but it's, it's a ceremony. It's a ritual. It was something that the Jews would do before they eat. And tradition and religion said that if you did not wash before you ate, that this defiled a person, this defiled a man, it would make them unclean inside. And so this, this problem with the Pharisees, with the scribes, is they were, they were people that were overly concerned with their outward appearance. Uh, if you read all through the New Testament, you're going to see uh, if you go through this plane, you're going to see all these things with the Pharisees. They're constantly doing things for, things for public display, right? Even there, they would talk about how they would go and they would preach, or they would, they would pray outside on the corner loud and where everybody could see them, probably, you know, kind of like looking around, like, is, is anybody looking at me? It was all about the demonstration. It wasn't about their heart. It wasn't about... God being uh, called to move. It was, it was about them being seen. We see this with fasting. It's like, don't fast like the Pharisees, right? Where you're like, I, yeah, I haven't eaten anything. And you walk around like you, like looking like you were fasting. Like, don't do it for those reasons. Wash your face. Make yourself presentable. Don't let on that you're doing that. And we see this called out over and over in the Pharisees. They're so worried about their outward experience, their outward uh, appearance is that they fail to realize where true defilement comes from. And so Jesus is going to set the record straight. And again, yes, for, uh, for your physical sake, please wash your hands before you eat. Okay, that's not saying we don't do that. It's not saying doing that is wrong. But what you need to understand is if you don't, it doesn't affect you morally. It doesn't affect you spiritually. Jesus rebukes them in this early part of the chapter, and he says, he quotes Isaiah and says, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart 
is far from me. Why? Why is their heart far from him? It's because on the outside, they looked clean and holy. These Pharisees, these scribes, they looked very presentable. They played the part. They looked good. But inside, these people were the ones that were the most unclean, the most unholy, the most defiled. And so setting all that up in Mark 7, verse 14, this is what Jesus said. That what it says, it says, summoning the crowd, Jesus told them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. So apparently during this time with the, the Pharisees and the scribes, as they're accusing Jesus of, of doing something that's contrary to the law, and they're interacting with him, at some point the crowd had kind of at least took a step back. You know, they at least, I don't, I don't know, you know, the Pharisees would tend to go on and on. You know, sometimes when we read the word, we, you know, there's a lot of stuff really packed in there. And we kind of think that's all there is to the story. But I have a, have a feeling that they didn't just say this one sentence to Jesus. They probably went on this whole big demonstration. How many of you know that when you get a handful of those type of people together, they can't just let one person speak for all of them. And it's probably on and on and on. And so the people had kind of taken a few steps back and, Maybe we're having their own conversations. We don't know what they were doing, but, but we know that they were at least kind of stepped back. And I would think I'd be ready for the showdown, right? Jesus and the Pharisees. This is great. Every time Jesus really puts it to them, you know, he really makes a fool out of them. But, but somehow, some way, they had kind of stepped back. And so Jesus calls them together. He's like, everybody, come over here, right? Come back. Come back around me. I got a lesson for you. Right? And he says, this lesson is important. Listen to me, all of you, and understand. See, there's two things here that, first of all, you have to listen to Jesus. And the second thing is you also have to understand what he is saying. Amen. Sometimes as we're reading the word, right, you're like, I'm reading it, so I'm listening. But I don't understand. Like, you will. Keep reading Keep asking, keep praying. You will understand. But when we listen, this means to consider what's being said. Find out what's being said and learn. Okay, so this is the taking in part, the listening. How many of you know that hearing and listening isn't the same thing? Right? I hear a lot of stuff, but what I actually listen to is different. That's the things that I'm... Wait a minute, what was that? How many of you have you've heard, you've heard something... You weren't really sure what it was, and then it kind of, you got a little piece of it, and it piqued your interest, and you're like, wait a minute, what'd you say? Now you're listening. Now it's like, now I'm considering what you're saying. Now I, I want to figure this out. I want to find out what it is. I want to learn about it. But then understanding is when we take that beyond just listening, and we bring it to our mind. Okay, so now it's got work to do. Now it's, it's beyond receiving, but we're going to put what we just heard to work. Consider what Jesus is saying and then bring it to your mind. All right, put it to work. It should affect and change the way you think about the situation or the topic if you listen to it and then you understand it. Romans 12, Paul tells us, Great, great instruction. Don't be conformed to this world, but be renewed, right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Where do you think Paul got such a wild concept? Jesus, right? He got it from Jesus' teachings. Proverbs 4, verse 5 through 9 says, Get wisdom, get understanding. Don't forget or turn away from the words of my mouth. Take the word of God Bring it together in your mind. Let it affect the way you think. Know that it is true. And, and what's important about this statement? What's important about it today? This, this parable, right? This statement Jesus is getting ready to make is the parable. It's probably, I didn't actually look, but it's got to be the shortest parable in the Bible. And no, that does not mean you're going to get the shortest sermon that I've ever preached. It's going to be just the same. All right? But but it's a short parable. So, so it's like he sets it up with this, like, guys, I'm not going to say much, but what I'm getting ready to say, you need to listen, okay? And then you need to understand. You need to, you need to hear it, 
that needs to come into your ears, but then you need to do something with it. It needs to go past that and go actually into your mind. This is important. Guys, I'm going to share something that is life-changing and transforming. Mark 7, 15, this is it. He says, nothing, say nothing. Yeah. Nothing that goes into a person from outside can defile him, but the things that have come out of a person are what defile him. Now to you, you might be like, well, that doesn't necessarily sound that profound to me today, but you've got to understand that in those days, this would have been an extremely controversial statement. This would have been very bold, very in your face. How dare Jesus come against the Jewish laws of these ceremonial cleansings, right? These were Jewish law. The book of Hebrews tells us a few insights as to why this would have taken place. It tells us that, that many of the things from the Old Testament are an example and they're a shadow of the things to come, right? So a lot of the things God put into motion in the Old Testament were to show us what Jesus was going to reveal when he came in the flesh. Uh, and it tells us that the food and the various washings and these fleshly ordinances, they were imposed until the time of Jesus, right? They were, they were to be done until Jesus came because Jesus said he, what? I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. I am here. I'm the completion of the law. Now it's follow me. So these rituals, these things that they had done, they had purpose, right? They had purpose, and this was the purpose, that when Jesus came, they would understand their spiritual nature. They would understand the spiritual truth. Mark 7, 16, he follows it up with, if anyone has ears to hear, he should listen. This is Mark's interjection. Right? Where Mark says, listen, this is what the Lord said. He started by listen and understand. He tells you that it's not about what you put in to your body that defiles you, but it's what comes out. And now, again, I want to make sure that you get it, Mark says. I want to reiterate this. If you have ears to hear, you should listen. Like, if you missed it, go back and read it again. It's basically what Mark is saying. You're like, don't skip over this. You need to really let this take root. If you have ears to hear, you should listen. Long ago, an old grouchy deacon, not in this church, we don't have him in this church, but there's this old grouchy deacon teaching Sunday school, and he wanted to help the kids uh, understand what a Christian is. And so he says to his class, he's like, kids, why do people call me Christian. And after a long moment of silence, a lot of pondering, and you can kind of see the wheels turning in this one kid's head, and he said, maybe because they don't know you. <laughs> I was seeing who was listening, all right? But, but that's the truth of the matter. It's like, why do they call me a Christian? The kid's like, maybe because they don't know you, because I don't think you are. You know, I mean, basically, the kid's calling out. How many of you know that kids will say anything, but kids will also tell you the truth? I mean, not when they are, not when their own uh, reputation's on the line, but when yours is, they'll tell you the truth. When it's theirs, they'll lie to you, right? They'll cover that up. This is what we're going to talk about today. They'll cover that up. But when it's you, they're like, I will tell you, sir, what is wrong with you. No shame at all. I'll tell you it all. Mark 7, 6, Mark 7 17, the next verse uh, after Jesus shares this, it says that he went into the house, away from the crowd, and the disciples asked him about the parable. So he, he gives this big truth, and he's given this to the public, right? The Pharisees and the scribes, they're still there, but this is for everybody. Pharisees, scribes, the crowd, the disciples, it's for everybody, remember? He said, listen to me, all of you. He was, he was clear that this wasn't directed at the Pharisees, that it wasn't directed at the crowd, that it wasn't directed at the disciples. He says, listen to me, all of you, and understand. And so he lays this out, and then him and the disciples, they go into the house, and they're like, Jesus, what? What was that? What was that about? 
Have you ever been a part of a conversation and you really didn't understand, but you kind of like pretended that you did? Right? It's like, I don't, like, I should know this. This is like, this is why a lot of people don't like to do Bible trivia. Sometimes I don't like to do Bible trivia because like, then I feel really stupid when I can't remember something that I ought to know. Right? So it's like, you, you, you're in a conversation and they're like, yeah, right? You remember that? And, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And then later you're like, I have no idea what he's talking about. Was I even there? Like, did that really happen? Um, and, and so you, you get like that, and, and what happens is then you, you get along with somebody that you trust, or, or the, maybe the person that, that it was about, and, and you're like, you know, actually, I don't remember that. Like, can you, like, can you fill me in? Like, I know I should know that, but, but really I don't, and, and I need you to, uh, to tell me what you're talking about. And so I would bet that as Jesus delivered this short parable, that I bet the disciples were standing there, because they were, right, they're the people that should know. I bet they were kind of like, yeah, right, do that, what he said, we're with him, guy, like, you guys know that, we're with him, like, do what he said, but as soon as they get alone, right, they didn't want to look like fools in public, but when they get alone, and they're like, all right, Jesus, I know this is something that I should have known, and I'm a little bit embarrassed, but what in the world are you talking about, like, it's completely over my head, I have no idea Mark 7, 18, the first half of that, he says to them, are you also as lacking in understanding? Wow. To the, to the men who had been walking with him day after day after day, he says, are you also as lacking in understanding? They weren't as lacking in listening. They had heard it more times than anybody else. They probably heard this before. It probably wasn't the first time that they heard something along these lines. Remember, a lot of these parables, it's a, it's a story to show you a truth. They probably heard other things that were trying to explain the same truth. He says, are you lacking as lacking in understanding? You heard it, but are you just like them where you haven't actually done anything with it? You haven't actually really thought about it and put it to work in your mind that this is true. They heard what Jesus said. They're having trouble understanding. They're having trouble bringing it together in their mind. Right? I got, I got what, what the Jewish custom is, what I've been taught my whole life, what I was raised to believe, uh, what my mother taught me, right? My grandma told me to do this. My dad did this. Like, this is the way that it is. And now I have Jesus saying, that's not it at all. It's in fact this. And they're having trouble putting those together in their mind, right? Like, how do I reconcile that? How do I put them together and figure out what is my end result? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to believe? As Jews, right, they were immersed in the doctrine of the Pharisees their whole life. This is what they had been taught all along, what they've been told. They can't quite wrap their mind around this. It's a radical concept. Let me tell you that when, we, when you read the word Jesus' ideas, Jesus' statements, they're all radical concepts, right? And in the moment when he's revealing them to people, every single time it goes against the grain of the culture. Every time. There was not one of them where everybody was like, oh, praise the Lord, that's what I believe too. We're on the same page. This is great. Every time they're like, what? What did he say? Are you kidding me? And they, that's why they constantly tried to kill him. Because everything was against what they believed. So if you can't wrap your mind around this radical concept, think about this. In this belief, uh, the disciples even were conformed to the world. Right? They were conformed to what does man say? What is man telling me to do? And they couldn't understand this spiritual principle. Do you know that we still have the same problem today? Even in the church that people are conformed to the world. Well, the world says it should be this, right? I mean, look at the hot topic buttons when it comes to elections every time. The world says it's okay to abort your baby no matter what. The world says it's okay for two men to marry, two women to marry. I want to tell you, Jesus says that it's not. 
Okay, and so we we're still fighting the same battle where the concepts of the world, they are in conflict with the truths of the word. Okay, and it, it will always be this way until Jesus returns. Even God's people are sometimes so conformed to the ways of the world. We're so conformed to the ways of man, right? Religion is hard to break off of people. And it's hard for the disciples here. Uh, we're, we're, we're so deeply rooted in traditions. We are so deeply rooted in people's opinions. Well, if the majority say this, it's wrong. Right? We go with if the majority says it, it's right. I'm telling you that if the majority says it, it's wrong. Right? Because the minority is lined up with the word of God. We don't, we don't have majority when it comes to that. The majority of the world, if the majority of the world was in line with the word of God, we would see a radically different world. Okay? So I'm going to tell you that it's not about popular opinion. And, and so if you're in one of those mindsets and then you get presented with the truth of God's word, you can hear it, you can consider it, but it really is difficult to make that come together, to bring it together in your mind. If you can't take the truth and what you believe and come to the resolution that God is always right, then your thinking is wrong. Okay? It's just, it's the truth of the matter. Okay? He is right and wrong has to go. That's the whole point of this. This is, this is where Jesus is going with this. Is that when you, when you have the two mindsets and you bring them together, my opinion, what I've been taught, what I feel, what I want, and God's truth, and you put them together, one of those is wrong. And it's never God's word. Okay? One of them has to go. So how about you this morning? Right? I know this isn't an easy, feel-good parable. I know this isn't so uplifting like, man, God just has blessing. That's, listen, I'm going to tell you, I really believe that's why we opened this service the way that we did. Unplanned. Talking about the goodness of God. Because when we get confronted with challenging truths from the word, we start to question if God's good, because that doesn't seem very good. That's not, that doesn't seem like, it's not something that I want, right? It's challenging. I want to tell you that even though this isn't a feel-good parable, I'm going to tell you that as, as it's one that challenges your heart, your heart wants to believe that this is true. Yes. It wants to believe that this is true, but it goes against your desire. It goes against what you want. So, are you willing to take the truth of God and renew your mind with it? Are you willing to take the truth of God and renew your mind with it? Even if it makes your life more difficult. You guys know that? That sometimes accepting God's truth and renewing your mind in His truth can actually make your life more difficult. Why? Because you're not going to be in the majority anymore. You're going to be. You're going to move over to the minority. You're going to move over to the the smaller group of people that are standing in faith on truth. Are you willing to take the truth of God and renew your mind with it, even if it costs you habits that you enjoy? Right. Because when you are faced with the truth of God, it's like, well, can't do that anymore. Can't do that anymore. Are you willing to take the truth of God and renew your mind with it, even if it affects the relationships you have in your life? Listen, here's a, here's a worldly concept for you. Nothing is more important than family. Some of you agree with that. I'm going to tell you, that's, that's a worldly concept. Jesus said, I will come and I'll bring division. Right? Father against daughter and son against mother and He's, he's talking about the fact that some people are going to grab a hold of my truth, and as some people apply my truth to their lives, it's going to cause other people they have a relationship with, even family, to reject them, to come against them, to mock them, to shame them. It's a certainty it will happen. And this is what he's saying, and I'm not saying family is not important. Praise the Lord, some of you guys have most of your family here today. Believing the same thing, that's great. Praise the Lord. Keep praying for the rest of your family. But I'm just telling you, this is the way that it goes down. Family's not actually number one. Or it shouldn't be. Jesus should be number one. This is why. 
One of those things is founded on truth. Listen, families are dysfunctional. Families have a lot of problems, and if all your hope and your faith is in your family, man, there's going to be a day you're going to be severely let down. Some of you already have. We probably, if we're being honest, we probably all already have been let down by our family at some point. Are you just going to listen, or are you going to listen and understand? I'm going to listen and I'm going to apply it. I'm going to listen and I'm going to renew my mind with God's truth today. Mark 18, second half and verse 19. If you ever wonder why when I put scriptures up and sometimes it'll have an A or a B in it, it's because it's the first half or the second half if I split a scripture like that. So it's where I don't want you to necessarily see the second half before I go through. Just in case you're wondering, anybody that's wondering where the A and the B is at in your Bible, it's not in there. So, But, second half here, don't you realize that nothing going into a man from the outside can defile him? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into the stomach and is eliminated. And as a result, he made all things, all foods clean. Right? These food laws were from the days of Moses. These food laws, they did not need to be observed once Jesus came on the scene. This is what he's teaching here. Even Peter had a really hard time with this after Jesus ascended. Like, months, possibly years later, Peter's still wrestling with this scripture that we're talking about today. Okay, Peter... It, you guys know if you read this through the word, Peter like messes a lot of stuff up. He's a little bit slow, but Peter has great redemption in, in the end. But, but Peter is wrestling with this even still. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter is in a trance. Okay? Now, if that, that kind of weirds you out, listen, some, like sometimes I get in a trance where I'm just like sitting there and I'm looking across the room, but I'm not actually looking. And usually Marissa is the one that will be like, Hey, what are you like? What are you looking at? Are you zoned out over there or what? But like, you just kind of get in that. You're just kind of zoned out. Like Peter's in this kind of kind of zone here, and the Lord starts to show him something. Like, like he starts to see uh, God bring this 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 blanket down from heaven, and and basically the whole thing is about uh, what has been previously unclean is now clean. Is what the Lord tells him. He says, he says, all those things that were unclean before, now they're clean. And so he's pointing out to Peter that Peter, like I wish he would have just made it this simple. Peter, like it's okay to eat bacon. Peter would have been like, thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad, right? I mean, it's okay to finally eat bacon. I've been sneaking it all this time. Right? Hallelujah. Could you imagine life without bacon? I'm so glad I'm not a traditional Jew, right? They still don't eat bacon. Like, oh man, that would be rough. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, bacon is, is good. My God said that he came to give life and give life more abundant to the full, and I believe that bacon is a huge part of that. <laughs> right? And like he says... When he said, like, I mean, imagine, imagine a kid. Okay, think about a kid. Uh, a, a kid that's never had bacon before, right? And it's like, once you give him that first piece of bacon, it's all over. There's no going back to not eating bacon, right? And so, like, imagine your life, like, right now, if you just, man, I couldn't have bacon anymore. Jesus said life, okay, that's being born again. That's being saved by him. He said life to the full, which is... A heavenly, godly, eternal life here on earth. And I'm going to tell you that bacon has a great importance in my life as far as it being abundant. As far as it being full, without bacon, it's not full. It's something is missing in my life, in my heart, okay? So, what is the significance of this besides the fact that bacon is excellent, okay? There's a big significance here. In the Old Testament, God had all these laws... And, and some of you are wondering, why did that even take place in the, in the beginning? Like, why did you have to go through the ceremony to cleanse before you ate? Why did they have to do some of these weird things? There was a very important reason for this. It was to separate God's people from the rest of the world. All these, all these ceremonies, all these things they had to do, they were to 
separate God's people from everybody else. Right? The people that aren't doing these things, like we know, they're not God's people because they don't do those things. They followed strict laws to show that they were the people of God. But now, all right, say but now. But now. This is important, right? Because but now also includes bacon, okay? Because they couldn't have it before. But now Jesus says that all this food that we eat, these things, all it does is it goes into our stomach and then it exits. Does anybody need help with that? Like that it exits the body. You guys know what I'm talking about. You go to the bathroom, right? You eat the food, it goes into your stomach, goes through some other stuff, and then it exits. That's, that's all food is, right? There's, there's no spiritual like attachment to the food. It's part of why when you know Paul's getting accused of, of eating food that's been offered to, to other gods and stuff, and Paul's like, I didn't offer it to those gods. He's like, it's just food to me. I'm eating it. I'm hungry. There's bacon, right? He's just like, it doesn't matter. It's just food. It just goes into my body. Gives me, depends on what you eat, some nutritional value, some doesn't, and then it exits. It's done. It's over with. And I'm, I'm moving on to the next thing. Jesus says, it doesn't go into your heart, guys. Like, imagine like, how many of you guys, let's just be honest. How many of you guys have ever wanted to like knock somebody on the head? Not like with a bat, just like a couple knuckles. Amy, you never want to do that? I think you have. I know your family, all right? Sometimes you just want to just want to give somebody a little like, like, listen here, you knucklehead. That's why people are called knuckleheads, because like you want to put your knuckles on their head. And I kind of imagine Jesus is kind of like, are you getting it, knuckleheads? Like, it's, it's like the food doesn't go into your heart. Hello? Knuckleheads, it doesn't go into your heart. It goes into your belly and it goes out and it's done and it's over with. Why is this important? Because God still today, and when Jesus shared this, wants his people to be separate from all the other people. Now, I don't mean like us having like a, a fortress that's like off in the woods and nobody else can come in. Not that being separate. I mean being set apart, being different from the world, from the other people. He still wants there to be things that make us different. When you're defiled, as the Pharisees were speaking about, it means that you're unclean. When you think about something being unclean, it would be like saying that it's, it's common. It's just ordinary. It has no real value. It's not any greater than anything else. He tells us to be holy. He tells us to be holy. To be holy is to be set apart. Set apart to what? To Him. Right? To set our lives apart to God. And the way that that's done now is not by what we eat. It's not by the ceremonies that we perform before we eat. Can I tell you a secret that if you... Uh, if you eat something and you forgot to pray for it, like you will be okay. You will be all right. Like some people get really bent out of shape about that. I like to joke about it. If I'm at a meal with somebody and somebody already started eating, I will say, hey, let me pray real quick. And like sometimes it's my dad or sometimes it's Channing has already taken a bite. And I'll be like, Lord, please don't let Channing get sick from the bite that she ate before the food was blessed. <laughs> Right? But I, I do that in a joking manner because it's funny and because you know what? You can, like, God gave us a sense of humor. Like, it's okay to joke around about things. But some people get really bent out of shape if you didn't pray before you ate the food. Some other people get really upset if you didn't pray for everybody at the table, for every country, for, uh, you know, everybody else in the restaurant. And, you know, they want, like, and everybody else is like, dude, my food's cold now. Thanks a lot, right? So listen, those things don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Like, thank the Lord for your food, yes. Uh, but, but don't let it be religion. Don't let it be this religious ceremony that if you didn't do it, like, oh man, now we're all going to hell, right? This is it. It's done. How do you, like, eat some more, guys. Like, enjoy your last supper, right? Break out the communion, okay? Like, it's, it's not like that. And so Jesus is trying to get his people to hone in on this, that it's not about those things anymore. 
be set apart to Him. It's not about what we eat. It's not about our ceremonies. It's done by what comes out of our heart. Amen. It's done by what comes out of our heart. When He talks about what's coming out of our heart, most of you are like, dude, all that comes out of my heart is blood. I don't really... Like, I want it to be contained. It can come out of the heart, but it needs to stay contained in the body. When he speaks of the heart, he's talking about the center part of the inner man. Okay? Uh, most of the time, most likely, it's going to come back to our thinking. Most of the time, it's going to come back to your thinking, what's in your mind. Proverbs 23, 7 uh, says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Right? As you think in your heart, so at the, the center of what you believe, what you think about, what you, what you uh, meditate on, these things, what, what, what is right there, that's who you are. That's what's going to be produced in your life. And so what do we think in our heart? This is important, what we think in our heart, because ultimately what we think in our heart will be produced in our lives. And so what you think in your heart, is it going to defile you or is it going to make you whole? This is the question that you have to ask today. Jesus goes on in verse 20. It says, Then he said, What comes out of a person that defiles him? For from within, say from within, out of people's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, promiscuity, stinginess, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Man, you wretched people. can't believe how terrible you guys all are. <laughs> Jacked up people. I feel bad for you. Bad people. No, this is me too, guys. This is all of us. He's speaking to... Remember who he's speaking to right now. Remember who's in the room as he's saying this. It's the twelve. It's his disciples. He's not saying this part publicly. He's saying this to the ones who are following him. In your heart, in your thinking, listen, we possess the capability of any and every one of those things. Any and every one of them. And in fact, outside of the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life, it's not just that you think them, but you also desire those things. Out of the heart, he says, comes evil thoughts. If you think about that, that proverb that I shared, 23 verse 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it's worded like this. It's like someone calculating inwardly, right? So it's not just like, well, I can't really control what I think. It's, it's you're calculating it. It's like you're measuring the cost of like, like, could I get away with this? Like, would it really be that bad? We, this, is, this is how it works. This is the evil thoughts that are within us talking to yourself. Some of you guys talk to yourself way too much. Okay? Some of you guys, I, like I've seen, all right? Like, we're going we're gonna to need an intervention if you don't quit talking to yourself like that. It's kind of weird. But it's like, it's that inner, like, these, these inner conversations, where you're, where you're thinking about these evil thoughts and, and you're really weighing out whether, like, is it going to, like, in the long run, is it going to be to my benefit? Like, and some of you guys are the opposite. In the short run, is it, like, I don't really care. Like, God told me not to worry about tomorrow, so can I get away with it today? Right? Some of you guys are thinking like that, trying to think about these things. And this is what he says. He goes on to say, it leads to 12 things. It leads to six sinful actions. Sexual immorality, so this is any sexual sin outside of the marriage of one man and one woman. This includes images and videos, okay, He's saying those evil thoughts will lead you to that, to those things. You better be careful. It says it leads you to thefts. Now, many of you guys probably don't steal, like, TVs and, like, cars. I mean, anybody good at stealing cars in here? Anybody? No, nobody steals cars. But, but, but what about... Um, Stealing time from work, right? While you're on the clock and you're not actually working, but you're doing something else. What about uh, cheating on your taxes, right? Those things are stealing. We just don't think about them like that. I'm just giving you examples of ways that our evil thoughts can lead us to sinful action. Murders, 
Anybody in here, I do not think, to my knowledge, nobody in here has murdered anybody. Uh, but when we think about murders, we need to remember that Jesus taught uh, that murder is a little bit more than a physical action that you do, but it is a matter of the heart, right? If you hate your brother, it's the same as murder. I know we got some haters in the room, all right? I know been there, done that time to time, right? We got adulteries, breaking the marriage covenant outside of biblical guidelines. And I want you to know something, that this rate is as high in the church as it is outside of the church. Okay? I'm just telling you, the thoughts, and I know that takes two and all that, but I'm just telling you, this is what Jesus says. The thoughts will lead us there if we allow them to. Greed, this constant desire to have more stuff and covet, uh, and then evil action. So basically, he's like, and every other evil thing that you could do. Like, whatever, like this isn't a full list. Evil actions covers... Whatever you can think of that I did not mention, this wickedness and these thoughts that we put to work. And then it can lead to seven or six sinful attitudes. Deceit, this includes lying, manipulation, covering up sin, right? Little kids, when they don't want to tell you the truth because it's going to cost them, right? That's deceit. It's a sinful mindset, right? So like even when we look at kids, we're like, Oh, that kid's sweet. That kid's never sinned before. Oh, yeah? What about the time when they smoked you in the head with that rubber hammer whenever you're trying to take a nap, right? Or when they lied to you, right? So, but praise God that God covers the sin of the little children. We don't have to worry too much about that. We need to be leading them in the way of truth. Promiscuity, this, this is specifically speaking of lustful thoughts. Jesus told us again, with that, it goes farther that to lust after someone is to commit adultery already in your heart. Stinginess. When I think of stinginess, when I was, when I was studying this, all I can picture is finding Nemo. Remember those seagulls? And they're just like, mine, 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 mine. Anybody? You, I know you guys that have kids have to have seen it. Look it up on YouTube, seagulls. Uh, finding Nemo, but they're just like, mine, mine, mine. They're just like, they won't shut up. It's like, everything's about them. They want they want the fish. They want whatever it is there, there is to eat. But it's this unwillingness to share, to keep everything for yourself. Uh, then blasphemy. And when we think of blasphemy, I want to tell you that it's not only, uh, it's this is not just strictly using God's name as a cuss word. It's not just using God's name as a swear word. But blasphemy is using God in any way that is not reverent or holy. Sometimes people say, I'm doing something in the name of the Lord, and it's like, that is not something that would be honoring to God. Sometimes it's saying that the Lord told me to tell you this or to do this, and he didn't tell you to do that knowingly. I'm not saying making a mistake. There's, there's more that goes into blasphemy than just saying his name as a swear word. Uh, it can lead to pride. This is arrogance and thinking too high of yourself. And then it can lead to foolishness. Again, just like with the actions, with the thoughts and the mindsets, the attitudes, he covers them all at the end. Like, basically the rest of it's foolishness. Anything that is not wisdom. Anything that's the opposite of wisdom. Where do these things come from? Verse 23, he said, All these evil things come from within and defile person. So, but we got to keep in mind today, church. We, we like to, as people, we like to make excuses and we like to point fingers. But, you know, I, I realize that the world that we live in does have an effect on us. But I want to tell you that our problem is not primarily the world that we live in. Our problem is not even primarily the devil, right? Like we like to blame a lot of things on the devil. That's not primarily our problem. Primarily our problem is that we have a heart problem. Primarily our problem is that we have a heart problem that we can't escape on our own. We don't have the ability to, uh, to overcome, to change our own heart, right? You guys know that. The Holy Spirit can change your heart. And so when we think about these things and, and where it leads us, these things that are, that are already in our mind, and that they can come out of us, and when they come out of us, it makes us unclean. When it comes out of us, it makes, it, makes us defiled. 
It was a reason why Jesus told us to take every thought captive and submit it to the goodness of Christ. There's a reason why he told us that. Because it's not a sin until we act upon it. It's, it's not a sin until we engage with it, until we move upon that thought. If we can grab it right away, right? Temptation is not a sin. It's the response to temptation that can be a sin. Church, what we need today is we need Jesus. Some for salvation, but, but, but some for, man, I'm struggling in my mind. I'm, I'm producing some things in my life because of the way that I think. My favorite thing that Jesus said, there's a, he said a lot of really good things. My favorite thing that he said, besides I came to give life to the full and fake. My next favorite thing that he said is I came to free my people from their sin. This is so important that we understand this, that, that he came to forgive sin for all who would place their faith and their trust and their hope in him, but he also came to free us from the sin, free us from our own mindset, to free us from the things that are buried deep down in our heart. He said, I came to free my people from that. Listen, he didn't come to free not his people from that. So for everybody else, the first step is salvation. It has to begin there because he said, I came to free my people. Right? It's, it's once we've given our life to Christ, we have the right to become children of God. We need the Holy Spirit. Right? Because he's the only one that can lead us away from sin and into righteousness. you're offended this morning, if this was a message where it's like, man, I thought I was going to get a good, uplifting, encouraging word, I'm going to tell you there's nothing that's more uplifting than being free. There's nothing more encouraging than knowing that the reason Holy Spirit points out things in our lives, the reason that some of the things that I shared and the words that I said may have struck a chord on the inside is because in your heart, you desire that, but the Holy Spirit is saying, but it's not right, and it's time to let it go. It's not right, it's time to let me free you from that. I want to tell you the Pharisees were offended as well. In Matthew's account, the same thing happens in the book of Matthew, but there's this one extra part, and this is what Jesus says about them. Matthew 15, verse 12 to 14. The disciples came up to him and told him, uh, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard the statement? I bet they did. <clears throat> Jesus replied to them and he said, Every plant that my heavenly Father didn't plant will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind guide the blind, both fall into a pit. This is what Jesus is saying, man. Don't worry about them. Like, it, it's, it's up to them to, they all listen. It's up to them to grab the understanding. For you guys, man, they're, they're, like, their heart is set on defilement. Their heart is set on abandonment. Their heart is set on coming against the truth of God. And if you follow them, you're going to end up in the same place. And this is the word for the church today. That if we continue to just... Well, this is what the world says. This is what's popular. This is what my peers say. This is what millennials say. This is what baby boomers say. This is what Gen X says. If we go with all those things, you're going to end up in the pit. The renewing of the mind. The renewing of the mind. We can't just listen. We also have to understand. Would you stand with me this morning? You would bow your heads and close your eyes. And this teaching, this parable that Jesus shares today, I want you to think of this, and I want you to consider right now and, and, and ask the Holy Spirit, is there, Lord, are there, are there any of these things that are in me? Is there any wicked way in me? Because again, we can gloss over those things and we can go back to what I shared in the beginning, which was, I'm mostly good. I'm pretty good. I'm not too bad. And 
listen, he doesn't want you to be good, pretty good, not too bad, mostly good. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be set apart. He wants you to be as he is. And so as you ask the Holy Spirit these questions right now, I want you to listen to what he says. But then I want you to understand it. I want you to join it together with what you believe, what you've thought, what you have leaned upon and desired. And I want you to let the words of God override what you've been taught. It takes a conscious effort to say, hey, I believe you, Lord, and I discard these thoughts. Don't listen to your heart, right? Those sayings from the beginning. Don't listen to your heart. Your heart is deceitful, right? Don't listen to your heart. Your heart's not in the right place in every area in your life. Jeremiah said the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? Only Jesus. It's only Jesus that can understand it. The one who created you. The one who discerns the intentions of the heart. Ask him to show you and then repent. Let him free you from wrong thinking and wrong actions today. When we think about the work on the cross, yes, Jesus died for your salvation. But I want to tell you that he rose from the grave for your freedom. And he desires that his people have both salvation and freedom. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. So Father, right now I just pray over each and every person here that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, we don't want a we don't want to just quickly think in our own minds it may be this, it may be that. Lord, we want to hear from you today. Lord, you're the one that truly knows the, the, the dark places, the hidden places of our heart, that sometimes they're even hidden from us. We want to deny their existence or we bury them and try to forget about them. Or, or as we give into a certain thing over and over and over, we begin to believe in our mind that it's right and that it's okay. And we just pray right now today that you would reveal your truth to each and every heart. Lord, show us what we need to surrender to you this morning. Show us what we need to surrender to you. We believe that you're able. We believe that you're willing. Holy Spirit, we believe that you are speaking right now. So have your way with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It's Jay